allyship, uh, LGBTQ allyship to intersectional feminist activism. Uh, that'll be on July 28th from 7 to 8 p.m. So keep an eye open for that as well. Um, with that, let me take a moment to introduce our presenter here. Um, Dr. Colette Dollarhide is a professor and program chair for counselor education and the associate chair for the Department of Educational Studies at The Ohio State University. She has been a counselor educator for 28 years and a counselor for 33 years and is an ACA fellow of the class of 2022. She is a cisgender, able-bodied, straight, middle-class woman with a highly diverse family, and she strives to be a lifelong learner about whiteness, social justice, privilege, oppression, and psychological and systemic liberation. She also works to be a co-conspirator, disruptor, and a servant leader. Dr. Dallahide has published over 50 national articles, has served as an editor for the Journal of Humanistic Counseling, and special issue co-editor of the PSC and CES. She has also presented over 150 times at conferences and gatherings on social justice, leadership, supervision, school counseling, pedagogy, and professional identity, all through a qualitative research lens. Dr. Dollarhide um, has served as the president of the Association of Humanistic Counselors, the president of Counselors for Social Justice, and is a co-founder of Ohio Counselors for Social Justice. Uh, we are just so thrilled to, to have you join us here, Dr. Dollarhide. So um, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, um, Tina and Betsy, um, and oh goodness, oh we lost. Did we lose our our other um, um, intern? Well, th thank you for um, for all of the work that the Professional Development Committee does in order to support counselors for social justice and um, and the, the opportunity that we all have for learning and conversation. So thank you to each of you. Um, and thank you all for being here. I recognize a couple of familiar faces, Alice and Lauren and um, Natis. And so I very much appreciate seeing all of you and um, appreciate your all being here. Um, I. Uh, really enjoy the opportunity to talk about um, social justice supervision. One of the things that I that bothers me about our field is that, you know, we talk about pedagogy and how to decolonize our classrooms, which is great. We talk about how to decolonize our syllabi, how to decolonize our, our conversations within relationships with our students. Um, but one of the really important ways that white hegemony has been perpetuated in our field is through supervision. And so um, as I started thinking about, um, about that problem and um, thinking about ways that we needed to, um, to make sense of all the research that repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly documented all of the fraught relationships within super, the supervisory dyad or triad, that um, continued to, to um, be experienced as oppressive by individuals who are uh, international, for example, or and individuals who identify from the marginalized communities who are black, who are Hispanic, um, who are um, non-English speaking, who are parents, all of these, these different criteria that um, have left supervisees feeling very vulnerable um, and have, been in response, feel that they have been um, treated poorly by the supervisor. Um, and so that's what, what led me to be thinking about how do we, how do we improve supervision in a way that, that um, allows the authentic self of the supervisee to be engaged fully in the supervisory process, to be valued for everything that uh, they bring to the profession uh, their own healing insights and their own understanding of, of how to facilitate healing for others. So um, that uh, is, is really kind of the motivation behind um, this approach. Um, so with that, please, um, you know, as, as um, Laura mentioned, if you have a question, uh, feel free to, to, to unmute yourself and say something. Um, because I do tend to get, when I get excited about something, I talk fast and I know this, and I don't want this to just be, you know, like machine gun, you know, I, I want you to feel like you can say, hey, 
slow down, I got a question. So please stop me um, if you have a question. Um, I won't be able to see you. That's why the auditory like, hey, you know, hold on, I got a question is gonna be helpful because I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I know that the professional development uh, committee has a copy of this PowerPoint. And so if at some point you would like to see it, um, I, I think that um, it would be very, um, very easy for them to share it with you. So. Can can everybody see my screen? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. OK, cool, cool. Um, so I recognize that that this conversation is by no means the end all of decolonizing cancer. Ed. It's a step. It's one step. Um, but but I hope it's a step that that people will um, consider as as you know, as you engage in supervision um, with people in your own um, in your own campuses or in your own practice. I want to offer first a land acknowledgement. And to me, the words matter. And that's why I'm not going to read the other slides to you. But these two slides, I really want to share. Um, so I am going to read them. Um, we, I want to make sure that we are offering this land acknowledgement, even though <clears throat> those of us gathered in this meeting occupy different physical physical locations. Um, it's important to reflect on the ground on which we live, work, play, and dream. This ground is not our ground, and this land is not our land. For more than 500 years, the First Nations and um, Native communities across this land have demonstrated resilience and resistance in the face of violent efforts to separate them from their land, their culture, and each other. They remain at the forefront of movements to protect Mother Earth and the life it sustains. But despite centuries of colonial theft and violence, this is still First Nations, Native Nations land. It will always be their land. And they are still here. They continue to fight for equity amidst a backdrop of ongoing colonialism and oppression. We should all educate ourselves about colonialism and our continued role in perpetuating the oppression of the, the Native Nations and her people. I also want to offer a, a labor acknowledgement First, I want to acknowledge that much of what we know in this country today, including our culture, economic growth, and development throughout history and across time, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans, their ascendants and descendants, who suffered the horror of the transatlantic trafficking um, of slavery, chattel slavery, and Jim Crow. We're indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout the generations, resulting in an impact that can be felt and witnessed today. And then as a result of COVID, um, I felt that we also need to acknowledge the un unnamed essential workers who labor for low wages and poor working conditions, who maintain our economic, educational, and social systems as we currently know them. We thank them and advocate for equitable systems of pay, benefits, and appreciation for those who serve in essential positions. So for me, it's really important to, to start um, any conversation um, or learning context with an acknowledgement of the forgotten persons, the forgotten um, and unappreciated persons who have enabled our lives uh, as they are today. Um, so with that, <clears throat> um, I would encourage you to um, email me if you have any questions about today's conversation. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, dollarhide.one at osu.edu. And so um, if at any point you're like, would like to continue the conversation, that would be great. Um, I have had a, a uh, terrific um, experience with, um, a number of individuals who've contacted me to say that they really enjoy using the model. Um, I've I've done at least, you know I've done one study um, on the implementation of the model. I'll share the results of that at the end. Um, but if if anybody's interested in working with me on some research projects, um, let me know because I'd be more than happy to to uh, work with you on that. I do also need to acknowledge that this presentation. Um, has been informed by a, a wide variety of different readings. At the end, there are a couple of also additional resources and references, um, but all of the thinking that has come before and all of the really profound insights um, about 
uh, communities uh, who experience oppression, um, I can't claim those insights at all. I, I'm, I'm um, working to hopefully bring practical, um, practical practice that's redundant, but anyway, um, to, to try to bring some of these ideas more uh, vividly and more vibrantly into our profession. So um, I'm using um, social justice as a term, and I know because um, different terms have been pulled out of the media and used in ways that are that are not congruent with their original intent, I use Sue's, Sue and Sue's uh, definition about systems awareness, empowerment, cultural affirmation, and advocacy that ensures that, op that um, oppressed persons have access to resources and opportunities that have been reserved for persons in privileged life spaces. Um, and it's really important to juxtapose that with multiculturalism because multiculturalism is awareness and appreciation for, for cultural realities. Social justice takes a step further into action. Um, and so when I'm talking about social justice, I'm very much using all of the embedded awareness and cultural affirmation, but also bringing it into the world of action and, um, and advocacy. And for me, uh, social justice supervision is just that. It's, it's action and advocacy. So I, I recognize that um, probably all of you either are supervisors or you've been supervisees. Um, and so you have some sense of what that relationship has been for you and, um, and maybe where it rubbed, maybe where it didn't feel good, maybe where you wondered what, what exactly did they mean by saying that? Um, am I really cut out for this field or um, am I um, somehow not a not a good fit, and you know I think that that it's reflecting on those experiences that made me realize just how dangerous supervision is in the hands of individuals who have no awareness of cultural realities, have no self awareness of their own implicit biases, because that <clears throat> gatekeeping function is um, is the very dynamic that has been used in the past to perpetuate white hegemony and perpetuate the belief that you have to look a certain way, act a certain way. I mean, even I was told um, uh, who, you know, who's mainstream in so many ways, I was told I, I smile too much, I laugh too much, and I use my hands too much. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Sit on them? I mean, they need to be free. <laughs> so we we can't um, um, we can't allow the gatekeeping process in within supervision um, to to create that barrier that keeps us from being able to bring the richness and the 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 vitality of of diversity and um, uh, all different. Uh, cultural realities, belief systems, identities, the, the intersectionality of all of those identities, they, they need to be in our profession because we need to service all of the persons who are in pain in our world. And we can't do that if all of the, the counselors look like me. That, that won't work. It has not worked. We've got the data. We know this. And we know that we need diverse counselors in order to provide culturally affirming and um, uh, diverse uh, appreciation and nurturing and mentoring and, um, and empowerment and um, uh, encouragement in our profession. So the, the problem that I would like to bring forward is that um, supervision has been used to perpetuate this monoculture, this you know, yeah, monocultural centrism. That it's it's uh, only the white way, only one way to view supervision, and <clears throat> the only people who know that are people who, you know, um, who belong to the the, um, the 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 privileged persons in our society. Um, I love this cartoon. What's the I'm, 
um, I'm going to try to get rid of this again. Hi, there we go. What's the matter? It's the same distance. What, what I love about this is that this guy looks just like Freud. <laughs> so, so it, you know, to me, this cartoon really brought a, brought a tremendous um, uh, insight and, um, you know, in a, in a humorous way, all of the, the ways that, um, that our field has uh, continued to put barriers in the, in the, the way of uh, individuals who identify from other cultures. Um, no room for uh, different ways of counseling, um, different ways of viewing issues, culturally embedded ways of understanding uh, the world and the reality, the intergenerational trauma, the, the ways that poverty impacts um, uh, lives uh, in, 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 in transgenerational ways. Uh, no room for unique cultural healing practices. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Allison, Allison Fears, who is um, in, our, in our group here. She's a doc student at William and Mary. She and I spoke yesterday and she um, shared with me a, a really um, um, helpful resource, the Racial Healing Handbook that walks people through uh, ways to approach their own um, uh, racial consciousness and to improve their, their racial awareness. Um, so, you know, being able to appreciate cultural healing practices from a broad perspective um, and, you know, no room for thinking about um, uh, the, the importance of cultural issues. You know, individuals who um, the, the, the murders of um, uh, Black men and women uh, in 2020 and continuing through to today, um, you know, individuals who are like, I don't see what the point, oh my gosh, it's, you know, um, when, when we have persons like that who are willfully unaware of the social and cultural issues in our society, um, that's, that's a cause for concern. So this model arises out of a desire to situate the personhood of the supervisee in the center of the process and to empower the supervisee to practice in a culturally congruent way within uh, their own awareness of, of the healing uh, process. Um, and so I, I'm using Brofen, Brofen Brenner's, I always get his name wrong, <laughs> um, but I, I love the ecological approach. Um, so understanding the core self, understanding immediate relationships, then extended relationships, organizations, and the dominant culture, and understanding how each of those uh, you know, uh, rings have an impact on the individual, as well as the individual having an impact on those rings. So the, the, you know, both the, the inward um, movement of, of influence, as well as the outward movement of influence, because this is the power of social justice, is not just saying, oh, well, these people, you know, these people, that individuals from oppressed communities are confined within this oppressive structure. They are, and we all have the ability to have an impact on the uh, systems that surround us. So there's, there's the, the ever-present um, hopefulness about um, cultural and social change. So the goal ultimately is to transform our profession through allowing the supervisory process to become uh, mobilized and energized by social justice. So the goal is, is liberation for both the supervisee and the client uh, through a culturally responsive and social justice informed liberatory process. And then looking for outcomes that not only um, provide greater opportunities for diversity within our profession, um, but is inclusive and inviting of those perspectives. I, I, the term tolerance is not part of this process. This is about embracing. This is about reaching out and holding close individuals to support them in their journey toward being a healer in our world. So <clears throat> the, it, I would encourage you um, to take a look at the, the article itself um, because there's a whole lot more in the article than I would get to talk about in our conversation today. But um, it, it came out in 2021. And so if you would like to um, have more information, um, please 
um, make sure to make a note for that that um, that article. Um, so this is the social justice supervision model that's on the screen here. <laughs> so ironic, I'm pointing to it, and I know you guys can't see, but um, the the um, I'm going to go over each step. Um, it it is it surrounds the ecological view of the supervisee and the client. So this this is used as a lens through which to view both the supervisee uh, and the client because super, uh, social justice is not only the process, but it's also the outcome, both for the supervisee and for the client. And so um, it's important to kind of remember that, keep that in the, in the back of your mind. Our, our focus is gonna be kind of on the supervisory relationship initially, and then that, super, that social justice um, perspective is gonna be um, extended and the supervisee will learn about social justice first as a, an ex, experiencing the social justice empowerment and, and then um, learning how to extend that to the client. So I'm gonna go over it step-by-step, step. sorry. Before I do, are there any questions so far or any comments or? I will, I, I don't wanna keep going and just assume that everything is, is cool. So if, if there's, you know, anything, feel free to stop me. Okay, okay. Um, so the first step is that the supervisor really needs to do their own work. The supervisor needs to be, needs to decolonize themselves and really needs to do work on what are my implicit biases and what are, what are the, what are all the messages that I've internalized through my ecological reality um, about other groups? And, you know, of course, we know when we're looking at, at values programming and, and how we internalize values that the earliest messages that we receive um, are the ones that go the deepest. They are, you know, kind of some of that pre-verbal learning. And so it, it takes a while. Um, I, <clears throat> Um, uh, in a uh, presentation a couple of years ago, I made what I thought was a joke about being a grammar Nazi. Afterwards, a colleague came to me and said, Colette, do you realize what you just did? You traumatized everyone in that room who is Jewish, who belongs to the LGBTQI community, you know, you, and, and I was, I was appalled. I was utterly appalled. It was like, oh my gosh, how in the world did I, where did I come up with the idea that Nazi was funny? Why, why did I make a joke? And I, it took me several weeks to, to figure out because it took a lot of reflection and, and thought. Um, I grew up uh, in the sixties um, and Hogan's Heroes was a show that was on, it was a comedy, um, and in, in that show, these American POWs were outsmarting the, their Nazi captors, and the Nazis were presented as c comedy. It was, and, and I, I, you know, so going back to my childhood, what was a show I was watching that that and I went back to the class and I apologized and said, I understand that what I said was highly problematic, um, and I apologize uh, and I have learned. Um, and um, you know, we as a supervisor, this first step is really taking a deep look at and all of the, our, our assumptions about all of the oppressed groups, um, cultures and communities in our society. Um, and this involves not relying on um, members of that community to tell you about, but it's extending relationships, it's, it's reading, it's conversation, it's um, uh, deep reflection. And, and that, that work is on the supervisor. That is the responsibility of the supervisor as they prepare 
to be a social justice supervisor um, because they have got to be able to understand how they are, who they are in order to invite the full personhood of the supervisee into that relationship. So it is a, um, a period of reflection and preparation. In the second step, the supervisor is now in contact with the supervisee, has done work so that they understand their own reactions and you know, are, can, can flag the minefield, right? We tell clients to do this, but we need to do it for ourselves. If there are uh, messages that are in there, you've got to be on the lookout for getting, um, for, for you know, those leaking out and doing your work on, on uh, countering those. Um, but it's, it's appreciating the supervisee and the identity of the supervisee in all of these systems and exploring all of these systems with the supervisee and understanding all the ways that the culture, uh, cultures that each supervisee represents um, has strength and resilience and beauty um, and, and looking for ways to appreciate and discuss those. Um, it also involves, you know, conversations about identity development, um, uh, their, an exploration of how they have come to understand their own identities um, and, you know, ways in which they have voice and power, ways in which they feel that they have been asked to give up their voice and their power, because the key in social justice supervision is that the supervisee has voice and has power. The supervisor and the supervisee share that, and that is explicit. So it's not an embedded part of it, it's explicit. Um, and that's talked about uh, with the supervisee so that they understand how important it is that they use their voice and use their power, not only for social justice for their clients, but also for themselves. And that in the supervisory relationship, that social justice um, uh, sharing of voice and power is a foundation. It's a critical piece of the relationship. Um, conversations about cultural healing traditions, about ways that they have seen pain expressed in, their, in the systems within which they're embedded, ways in which they've seen healing happen in the systems in which they're embedded. Um, and then, you know, one of the most powerful tools for um, social justice is this discourse analysis and deconstruction. So it's taking apart the societal messages that are, are circulating at the time or that they have heard or internalized and deconstructing those so that the, the um, this, in order to allow the supervisee choice and the ability to, to um, reject a discourse that is um, disrespectful and oppressive. And so all of that is a time consuming part of the supervisory process. And one of the, my concerns in, in, in the, the uh, practice of the model is that <clears throat> it, it um, it, it's not, how do I want to put this? It's, it, the, the model is set up with steps, but practitioners of the model have told me, um, and I can see very clearly why, um, the, this explore step, the step number two, actually takes place throughout the entire process. It is a continuous and um, ever-present element within the supervisory relationship um, because it, it's, it's not possible to, to have one or two conversations and then we know everything we, there is to know about, you know, no, the, the complexity, the nuances, the, the intersectionality of all of the constellation of identities that our supervisees hold, um, that 
unfolds, you know, like the petals of a flower that opens uh, slowly and in its own time. So even though it's stated as a second step, it is important to recognize that this is a fluid piece that does uh, percolate throughout the entire relationship. Now that the supervisee has experienced acceptance as who they are, as all that they are, um, then their confidence in their ability to um, be a healer um, is, is usually enhanced. It usually increases because they're not doubting their intuitive healing voice. They, they feel valued, that that voice is valued. And so in, in the third step, third step, um, the client now becomes a, a critical part of the social justice process. And as the supervisee has experienced the, the, the social justice um, elements uh, within that relationship and the empowerment and the respect, then they now turn to practice those skills with the client. Um, <clears throat> I've got supervisors who have been using this both in clinical mental health and school contexts. And in, in both of those contexts, the, for, for, for many of the supervisees, um, this step is one of the most eye-opening steps because now they're looking at the systems that surround their client and they are becoming more and more aware of the ways that the identities of the client is a critical factor in understanding how to help healing happen. Um, and so it, there's, there's a tremendous amount of insight that the supervisee gains as they're doing social justice work and advocacy on behalf of their clients. And in fact, it's so important. Um, and one of the things that I think is critical about, uh, about this step is that it, what it does is it puts social justice and the therapeutic goal on equal footing. And so with every client, um, the supervisor will challenge the supervisee to articulate both a social justice goal and a therapeutic goal. So that the social justice goal is processed in supervision, just like the therapeutic goal is. I hope that makes sense. It's really important that this conversation be organic that it is a natural part of the relationship, that it becomes a natural part then of the relationship for the supervisee with every client. Now, one of the challenges is when the supervisee and the client and the supervisor share a privileged identity. And that, that has, has been an interesting experience for the people who are using the model as they you know, talk about you know, the importance of not assuming, not stopping the, the social justice process just because uh, the supervisee ha holds uh, a, an identity that is privileged in, in some contexts. Uh, as well as the client holding uh, identities that are privileged in certain contexts. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to mention that because that has been a, a topic of conversation with um, some of the practitioners of the model. Um, in the- Question? Yes. Hi, Molly Proctor Green. Um, Hi, Dr. I, Green. Um, clinical social worker, LCSW. Um, I am in Virginia and I supervise um, MSWs working towards their hours for licensure. And I'm curious to know, what does a social justice goal look like 
when the client, the clinician, and the supervisor come from largely positions of privilege. The presenting problem is very um, clinical, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Maybe it's anxiety mm -hmm. or grief. Mm -hmm. What would a social justice goal look like in that kind of dynamic? Um, one of the things that I would, you know, recommend is that the, the conversation in that context would focus on what are the messages that the client has internalized about that diagnosis or that clinical issue, um, getting them in touch with you know, a social, um, excuse me, social shaming um, that frequently and, and stigma around help seeking, stigma around, you know, um, uh, you know, chronic uh, grief or, or terms that, um, that sometimes percolate throughout um, society that make people ashamed um, of their challenges. So I would, I would probably focus on that as a social justice goal, um, uh, looking at ways that the, the diagnosis itself or the, the process of coming for help or some other part of their experience has caused them shame or pain. Thank you. Kind of a, kind of a, like a, like an echoing of that, but like a dovetail into a different thing. I was thinking, does that, where does this kind of, um, either run in parallel with um, like advocacy on the part of the <laughs> client, because like if that's a social justice goal, right? Like kind of breaking down the social shaming around their diagnoses, is there part of just besides kind of the cognizance and realization of the systems in place and what those have kind of put forth as this, you know, like you said, social shaming, right. Right. how does that kind of dovetail with advocacy if, in any part for on the part of the client, if, if at all? That's a really, really good question. Both, both your question and Dr. Green's are, are really good. Thank you. Um, one of the elements about um, social justice that I, I appreciate so deeply is the building of community. And, um, and so, you know, as exploring perhaps with the client, you know, what are ways to connect with a community that could give voice to uh, the rejection of that shaming and the, the, the change, changing of people's opinions or perspectives about the stigma, those kinds of things. So connecting, and, and this is you know, something that's so important with um, any social justice goal is connecting with that with community um, and building, um, building you know, the the ability of all of our clients and our supervisees to, you know, ally with, join with, um, share voice and energy with communities that that they, you know, feel drawn, you know, a, a connection with and belong with. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, uh, my, my granddaughter um, came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and um, uh, so I, this, this year I was able to go to several pride events with her um, and show off my, my beautiful tattoo that reflects Brett's. I don't think, know if you can see it or not, but it's the, the pride flag that's behind you, Brett. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it, and, and, and watching her connect with the community, with community uh, was, was really significant. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Are there any, any other questions or thoughts? Okay. So how are we doing on time? Am I going too fast? 
It looks like Adrian had a, 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 a comment that was posted in the chat. I don't know if Adrian, you have an opportunity to share. Yeah, sorry. I'm kind of eating in the background, my bad. But as I heard you talking, as I heard you talking, Dr. Dollarhide, and as I even think about my experiences and what we talk about in my doc program is, you know, starting with the client, because oftentimes when it comes to social justice or different things, clients have internalized and um, thoughts or views on different mental health aspects, um, like Dr. Green said, such as anxiety or grief and how that's supposed to look based on their culture. So a lot of work it, for me is kind of help client maybe recognize those things and work with them and help them um, see that as an underlying factor to issues, but also then helping them advocate and then myself learning how I can advocate within the community too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. That is a, that is absolutely what, what this is designed to accomplish. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. It is um, a sad statement about how many of our clients uh, come with such deep shame. Um, they're, they're in pain and then they're embarrassed, you know, they're embarrassed about their pain. And um, it, it is, uh, it, it feels like it, it's a compounding of their, their trauma, you know, um, that they hold such shame around um, you know, their, their mental health status or um, the, the source of their, of their grief, you know? Okay. So um, the, um, fourth step, uh, and by no means the final step because the, 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 the cycle um, we'll, we'll begin again. I'll, I'll kind of get to that in a moment. But the fourth step then is, you know, a kind of thinking about how closure has occurred uh, for a, you know, one of the clients. I mean, so, you know, this entire model um, cycles repeatedly throughout the, the supervisory relationship because it's important for the supervisee to have an opportunity to reflect on the, the work they did, not only as a clinician, but also as a social justice um, advocate and um, uh, social justice, I, I, you know, um, facilitator, perhaps use that term. Um, one of the things, you know, certainly, you know, it, it would, I would encourage the supervisee to process as we do, you know, uh, with terminating with a client, you know, process what was it like, what were the things that are most meaningful for you, um, and, and process both that therapeutic goal and that social justice goal. Um, and so then the supervisee has an opportunity to process those reflections with the supervisor. And in that process, they're also talking about that relationship between the two of them. How has the supervisee felt supported? How has the supervisee, excuse me, felt heard, um, respected, listened to, um, affirmed? Um, because the supervisor and the supervisee together then are able to experience the renewed commitment to social justice um, that, that comes as people of like minds are able to come together and, and see the value in each other and the value in the work that they do together. Um, and so that sort of keeps the supervisor in a reflective mode also about the impact of their identities um, and you know, then continues um, the 
the constant awareness and affirmation, a cultural affirmation for the identities of the supervisee. <clears throat> and then, you know, that is extended and extended and extended. So with each supervisee, the social justice cycle is modeled and taught and then processed and modeled and taught and taught and processed so that it's a, um, it becomes, you know, a second nature part of the, the supervisory relationship, the way that we view what we do. Um, and I think also it, it increases as we're connecting our, you know, our clients are being connected with their communities, our supervisees are being connected with their communities also. And those connections are the foundation then of the, the, the healing work that they will do, you know, uh, hand in hand with the communities that they represent. Um, so I, it, it just feels like this would, would be a process that would, would be a catalyst, right, for um, the, the social justice work that we need to do with the boots on the ground in our communities in a hand-to-hand hand -hand, um, sort of process. Um, in terms of the um, uh, first wave of adopters that uh, participated in a study, um, they noted a number of advantages and a number of challenges in using the model. Um, the advantages included um, that they felt it definitely increased their social justice awareness and their social justice identity and commitment. Um, they felt that that was true not only for their own practice, but also they saw that commitment come to life in their supervisees, and that was very meaningful for them. Um, they did appreciate the model because it, it was, they felt clear, you know, um, kind of these four steps. Um, even though they're not discrete steps, they, they you know, progress um, in a fluid manner, but they, they felt that that gave them the structure to be able to feel like they could move forward with um, social justice in their supervision work. Um, and they also felt that it really was advantageous in terms of um, being able to use the clients' identities that, that some of the supervisees did not see social justice as an issue in their lives. They saw it in the lives of their clients and then began to internalize more of the, the social justice awareness. And so it, it was, a, um, again, using the word catalyst, um, the, the clients' identities was a catalyst for the supervisee to dig deeper and reflect deep, more deeply in their identities. Um, some of the challenges, um, they, they, the supervisors did um, with uh, some of the supervisees, they did spend time teaching uh, or encouraging the supervisee to, to be more aware of cultural realities, to be more sensitive to identities and the intersectionality of identities, to, to, to be able to um, articulate more empathy for the oppressive experiences that the client brought in. So they, they did say that they did devote the time to um, bringing their supervisees to speed is kind of the way that they, you know, up to speed. Um, for the social justice work. Um, second, some of the supervisors felt that the step, they, they, they felt like they needed to keep to the step one, step two, step three. And so they felt that that um, kind of created some artificial pressure. Um, and so when we talk more about it and talk more about it being more of a fluid, kind of a circular fluid, you know, that the cycle can go around several times, then, then they felt, you know, that helped them to feel more fluid about the use of the model. Um, and then um, the supervisors, um, again, with the privileged identities who were um, supervising counselors, supervisees with privileged identities, um, you know, they weren't sure how to um, 
really engage in the deeper intersectionality exploration of uh, and and uh, exploration of the systemic realities at, at first. They did, with some practice, realize, of course, that there are multiple levels of nuanced identities, uh, socioeconomic reality, um, neurodiversity, um, diagnoses of their own um, mental health uh, challenges, et cetera, et cetera, that, that di they, they did f then find ways that it was important to, to broach and to bring social justice uh, into, the, into the conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I recognize no model is perfect and, you know, there is no such thing as, you know, a, a, a one, one, you know, stop shop for all of these uh, nuanced, this nuanced work. But, um, you know, hopefully this is um, not only allowing the supervisor to um, to make social, to prioritize social justice in that supervisory relationship, but it also kind of continues the social justice conversation about each client, each client, each client, and with each client that teaches the supervisee more and more about how to, um, how to experience social justice in a meaningful way. Um, Dr. Dollar. Yes. Uh, before you continue on, we have a question in the chat here from yes. Allison. Okay. Allison asks, uh, I was wondering what resistance looked like, expecting it would be a challenge on the supervisee, supervisees side. Uh, not surprised about this. Given the limited time that doc students and educators have in supervision, what tips are there for encountering resistance with supervisees in this process? Um, I, I love that question because that is really, really, that is absolutely predictable. It is going to happen uh, to all of us, um, no matter how much we think we, how open we are and how accepting, et cetera. Um, the resistance that, that the early adopters did encounter was um, one in particular, uh, a comment that was made, um, uh, the, it was a qualitative study, and one of the transcripts um, contained a reflection from a supervisor that the supervisee said, um, you know, I don't see why we're spending all this time talking about me and talking about, you know, uh, um, your identity, my identity. That's that's not what we're here for. And so, you know, that that particular supervisor um, went on to talk about, you know, that it was a moment of real eye-opening insight into that particular supervisee. And so what she did was she stepped back um, and, and started from kind of the ground level and said, this is why it's important. And, and you know, did uh, share, it had the supervisee read um, some articles on social justice. And then she did sit and, and spend some time in a conversation with um, that resistance supervisor. Yeah, supervisee talking about um, what did she understand about social justice? Where, um, how did she experience her multicultural class? What were some of the challenges in it, um, et cetera? So it, um, in, in that instance, the supervisor just really kind of said, okay, put, put pause and just really step back to, to really talk about, you know, in what ways had the supervisee developed resistance to the idea of social justice itself. Does that help? Yes, thank you, Dr. Dollarhead. Dentavius, did you have a question also? Oh, yes, please. I, I... Uh, first, I appreciate this presentation and conversation. One of the things that I was thinking about in step one, the um, self-reflection stage of the model, um, how much time supervisors would have to spend on reflecting on their own willingness to broach and explore race, ethnicity, and culture with their uh, supervisee. 
Mm -hmm. um, just for context and, and, and how if the supervisee is on a higher level of racial identity development mm -hmm. and their supervisor, how that impacts, you know, the, the interaction there and, and in the supervisor relationship. Um, just for, for context, I want to share, I, I recently had a, a situation with um, a white male client. I wore a, a Black Counselor's Matter shirt and um, I sort of felt like my supervisor was unwilling to have the conversation. So I guess the question is, how do you also kind of as a supervisee set goals around um, social justice goals within the supervisory dyad as well? Because that can um, impact the larger goal of the, uh, the model. Yes, absolutely. So um, if, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly and hearing you fully, um, it, uh, your, your first question was about like step one and how long it took people to kind of go through that. Um, the early adopters took a summer before their fall um, supervision assignment. And in that summer, they met with each other and held each other accountable um, for, the, for doing readings on their own, for their conversations about um, broaching and their their implicit biases. They all went and did the IAT, you know that those kinds of things. So they they as a group and and they they all knew each other as doc students and they all worked together. So there was you know that that camaraderie um, of you know wanting to um, encourage each other. You know I think when individuals are adopting it into their own practice and don't have that community to be able to engage with that way, then you know I think that 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 could take uh, longer or shorter, as you pointed out, based on their identity development. Wouldn't that be a great study? You know, <laughs> um, so any you know as a a dissertation topic. Um, and, and I love what you said about the supervisee. So here's the supervisee with an advanced um, cultural identity and awareness of social justice, and they encounter a supervisor who is not at all. Um, I recognize that, that, there are, that, that the power differential exists. I, I recognize that. And, and so as a supervisee, um, you know, is there a way, I mean, you know, inviting the supervisor, you know, absolutely. But I do recognize that, that, um, and, and being a, a man of color, um, you, you know, you would need to be able to assess how much risk to your dreams and your goals uh, are you willing to engage in that moment with that relationship with that person? Um, and and it, that sickens me. I'm sorry. To, I just it bothers me tremendously that it that we would have people in supervisory positions who would be un, not willing to engage in those discussions. That it, it saddens me, you know, tremendously. So. Dr. Zollerhold, um, your comments made me think a little bit about, I think the supervisors, absolutely, I think they need to be especially aware of their own biases. And I guess I'm just thinking about in general, like being in this field as clinicians, how can we really be present for our clients when we're not aware of our own selves, right? Um Right. Yeah, so this is also so incredibly necessary. Yeah, yeah, so necessary. And what I what I you can only meet people where you've met yourself. And I think right. that that's the comment that I've say quite frequently to my clients. And you yes. know, like, and people can only meet you where they've met themselves too. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's some awareness when they're having their own challenges of why people don't understand why they're going through what they're going through. It's often not about you, it's about them. Yeah. And the same thing goes for yourself when you're trying to work with your clients. And I'm thinking about as a supervisor, what that would look like. How can you meet your supervisee if you haven't met it yourself? Exactly. Deep speaks to deep. And so if you haven't plumbed the depths of your own identity, how, how can you 
hope to understand the identities of the client or the supervisee. Yeah. Um, I think that that one of the one of the really important um, study uh, elements that to be explored um, is what does this model look like for <clears throat> you know specifically for for supervisors of color and you know um, um, and and I I think that would be a very exciting study so I hope somebody does that. <laughs> um, one of the things that 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 I wanted to um, kind of end on, and then and then open it up for more comments and questions, is you know for counselor educators, what um, what this means um, in master's training is you know how do we bring our best social justice selves to supervision, um, and as we're training our doc colleagues who are going to who are our future colleagues. Um, you know, we need to be able to help our new supervisors understand ways that that supervision has been used in the past and how supervision needs to be conceptualized for a, a better future uh, in the field. Um, and that it's it's our ethical and moral obligation to do so. Social justice is in the ACA ethics. Um, so it's not, it's, you know, uh, people who say, oh, I don't, I don't practice social justice. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> That's unethical, you know, so yeah, and we need to stop playing about that. We need to hold people accountable, um, in my opinion. <laughs> so, um, okay. I'm going to, oh, um, I did want to say that there are references at the end of the PowerPoint, uh, and now I'm going to stop sharing uh, and, and give us a chance to have a conversation. Um, so if anybody has questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I am, and sorry, I know I had spoke earlier, so I don't want to take up too much space from other folks, and, but I, and I'm not sure of everybody in the room, um, but I would love to hear from others because recently, I have a friend and colleague um, in counselor ed who's in a state <clears throat> that, and I wasn't aware of this, but this state will CRT ban, but they also um, pass this in higher ed as well. So their program is having a lot of pushback and they're already in an area that um, is not diverse. And so even though my friend is white, she has had a lot of issues with talking about diversity. And so when I think about like as a doc student trying to do supervision with a master where they can write a letter and say that you made them feel inferior by talking about these things. Um, and so I just, you know, I'm mentioning that and thinking about that as we even think about this model and how so much political things are going on and how you know some of the barriers that can come up for folks in different states or different programs because of that so I I appreciate that, Adrienne. I um, um, I find that absolutely tragic and horrifying um, that uh, CRT um, cannot be discussed in higher ed. And I know in Ohio, in Ohio that's a um, th there is a bill. There was a bill. I'm not sure of the status of it. I've tried to follow it and. Um, they're being very sneaky about it. Um, anyway, and, and that's terrifying. Um, the idea that someone could, could complain and, but you know what, this is okay. So I'm, of course I recognize where I am in my life. If someone wrote a letter and I lost my job because of doing the right thing, fine, that's fine. You know, I, I would go out with my head held high. 
Um, but I recognize that's because of where I am in my life. And that's very different from people starting out in their profession and, you know, needing to, their dreams and hopes are all invested in, in the resources and time and energy they've, you know, devoted to getting this, this degree and this into this career. So I recognize the, the risks are not equitable at all. So thank you for bringing that up. I think just a little selfishly based on like my background as a school counselor, I worry that school counselor supervisors don't know any of this. And how do we really train and like get to our site supervisors to implement a model like this so that our school counselors are more effective when working with with their kiddos. Um, I just, I worry about school counseling supervision. I think clinic, like my clinical um, peers, you know, they, they're always working on those, on those hours and things. And I'm like, oh no, but we're not as school counselors. But I don't know if you have, or anybody has any, oh, words of wisdom there for school counseling supervision. Well, Betsy, I, this isn't an answer whatsoever, but this is something I scream constantly of how school counseling does not get supervision, period. But especially the amount, because like both you and Dr. Dollar, I'd have heard me preach about this, but my work in anti-racism within a rural school or rural school district because of how much work I did, but I was not given supervision or toolkits to be able to effectively do work in those areas until I got into my doc program and started going through supervision myself. So it's, it's one thing where I think that's definitely a big advocacy step for us in this field of asking, like, if people are like, oh, you don't need to do individual supervision for school. I'm like, well, why not? Like, okay, if I've got to hold extra meetings, I think that's going to be more beneficial. And that's something that I was literally thinking about throughout all this. I'm like, the more I hear about it, the more I'm thinking, if I am to go into that field or even thinking next year too, of saying we need to start doing this. I don't care if it's harder. I don't care if it's more time consuming. I'll sign up, I'll volunteer because it needs to happen. Speaking as a previous school counselor myself. I'd like to respond. I certainly don't have an answer either. Um, I, I trained as a school counselor and I currently work as a, a school-based uh, clinical mental health counselor um, in the state of Maryland. But I, I'll, I'll just share, um, in my program, it was embedded in the coursework, in the uh, foundation coursework for, for, uh, for um, school counseling and in the internship courses and in practical courses. And although that doesn't carry over into you know, the supervisor relationship because of that disconnect you talked about, um, Dr. Perez. But um, I feel I, in my current position as a supervisor, I feel empowered to like advocate for myself when, when the supervisor isn't aware or when the, you know, there's a, a knowledge barrier where you know, it's not being disseminated. Um, so I think the first step is like, in leadership and counselor ed and like learning it in our classes and in the coursework and then it carries over into um, our students ability to like advocate for ourselves and to hold supervisors to the i guess back to your terminology dr Dalha, the the social justice goals that um exist within the model So I was, I, I very much appreciate you saying that, Dantavius, because, and, and I, I very much love, Betsy, that you just said, yeah, the state of California, I was trying to read up on a lot of legislation related to this. Um, and, and it's just, it's just astounding that like, like the standards are not the standard anywhere. Like everything is arbitrarily defined in every single area. So that was kind of one of my questions. And I think you alluded to it a bit, um, Dr. Perez, with like, how do we implement this, right? Like, how would this actually be 
the change because I'm like this conversation is just amazing right and it's just like so like on a like systemic advocacy level like how right like how do you kind of make this <laughs> ubiquitous right like how do you do that could be rhetorical because I know it was like a big damn question but <laughs> I'm still a doc student, um, but God, I, I'm hoping that you know we'll get there someday. And you know, I, you know, as as you said, I think um, California is starting to make strides. And talking with you know some of my friends and colleagues that are still school counselors out there, they're just like, oh, but we're gonna have to pay for it. I'm just like, yeah, but you're gonna be much more ethically bound and able to, you know, cor not correctly, but, you know, provide that supervision for future school counselors. We're not just doing it on a whim. Um, we're not just, you know, being like, oh, well, this is how I do it, but that doesn't create, I don't know, I don't see it as very helpful when you don't have a model to follow and, and social justice being so just like, in my opinion, necessary for school counseling because you're dealing with little children and you know again I have a soft spot because I was a practicing school counselor but that's how I I'm saying like some of my colleagues being like well we have to pay for it it's like it's I'll help you pay for it and I'm loaded with loans right now don't worry about it you know I I just really want to to comment very quickly on on one thing the people who are of my generation are, are retiring. And you all, every single one of you, you are the future. You are the profession. And you are gonna change the profession to make it what it needs to become. So the people like me, as we move out and move away and go all on, you guys have, will have the power to be able to make those changes that we need to make. And so I, I am filled with hope. Uh, I'm filled with joy when I see all of you and your passion and your commitment. Um, it, it fills me with hope. Um, I'm so proud of, of the, the, the way that, that as, as a field, we are changing our thinking and you guys are making the field better because you're asking the tough questions and making those tough, you know, pointing out those tough places where we need to change. So thank you. I don't know if anybody else on up. here is a doc. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I don't know who else on here is a doc student or will be in the job hunt soon, but uh, wherever those retirees are, Dr. Dollar High, let us know. <laughs> I have something quick to say. My name is Kira. I'm from uh, New Jersey. Um, I work in Newark, New Jersey as um, a supervisor in a group home. And um, a lot of our clients um, come in, they are honestly homeless. Um, so it's a, my program is a 10 day stay. It's for people that are experiencing, you know, like a crisis or emotional distress. We try to stabilize them. Um, and I'm trying to get some of my supervisees, I guess, to try to have um, goals, as you said, that are not just clinical based, but also based um, in social justice, but they're not really thinking, I guess, about that. They're just more concerned with what resources do I have that I can give these people because they need, they need food on their table, they need clothes on their back, like they don't have that. So I don't know if, if anybody has any suggestions of how I can encourage them because I see a lot of them getting very um, discouraged just at the state of just the world and just Newark, New Jersey as a whole. Um, I don't know if anybody has any suggestions for me. Um, Kira, I would just, as you were talking, um, you know, 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate, I can appreciate that, that the, the, the emergent nature of the work could keep your clinicians very locked into those survival. They're, you know, they're, they're concerned about the client's survival. Um, and I, I, I wonder if, if um, having kind of some group supervision with some of your clinicians might help with the conversation about, you know, starting to think about social justice goals and ways in which the, the, the more, um, you know, the client identities, in addition to their homelessness, which that in and of itself is a, a huge part of, of the, the, their identities. But, you know, what is it that, in what other ways are your clients human? Um, and that might help them to maybe slow down a little bit. And I don't know, just, it's just a thought. Another, um, and this is stemming off of things I've been told by other educators when in thinking more about social justice, of like it feels overwhelming when you're just trying to deal with it alone. Um, and they, especially when it comes to advocacy, it's like, oh, well, there's these laws in place, there's a system that's broken and understanding that that work is not something to be done alone. Um, I think of projects like, for instance, maybe in a school background, we used to get the team together to get backpacks for the kids. Now, if I were to do that by myself, um, <laughs> gathering the donations, outreaching to families, sending kids home with backpacks, doing that all by myself, would have been way too much overwhelming, but linking with others. I think that's something is this community partnerships and even the school too, and going back and forth on ways of thinking, how can you make your circle bigger um, to where you're surrounding yourself with like-minded social justice advocates and can have this collective work in which you're helping your clients. Um, maybe not directly or specifically their uh, populations or specifically their um, neighborhoods, but think of different ideas like that. So then it's not all on you um, would be my advice and just some thoughts are going through my head. I mean, to kind of, to kind of go along what Allison said also Kira, and I kind of, I just kind of alluded to this a bit in the chat, but I think, I think, yeah, this model is very apropos of, of everything in your practice because any implicit bias they may have may be kind of the subliminal reasonings as for why they're just kind of very quick, like, this is the resource they need, they need to get that, right? Like, and so like that level of like cognizance on their part, like totally needs to be addressed because like if, if they need more than that, then like they're just overlooking and they may like think that that's the quick fix, right? Like they may totally overlook every other thing and then it's just repeating the cycle, right? Like, great. So you help someone get the bottom two of Maslow's, right? But like, you're not finding them that community or getting connections or anything like they're never going to move up and you're just going to keep cycling that. So it's, so I think, I think things like, 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 like this model are, are extremely conducive to just kind of like what else and everyone's kind of alluding to is it's just, just really balancing out kind of the work of everyone in the practice as well. Um, Again, I know I know you're your supervisor, right? So it's again like, how do we make these systemic changes? I get it, but but yeah. It made me think a little bit about what um, when we're talking about social justice in general, right? That it's not just right, it's it's all parties involved, right? And so the the clinicians that you're supervising, like what Allison's referring to, like getting other folks involved. Um, I think oftentimes we think a lot about like the individual, like like self-care perhaps is a conversation that comes up very frequently. Like clinicians, make sure you get your self-care, self-care. When I think the community care is really like, really, really invaluable, right? And so what can, how can we show up for one another and recognize that this type of work isn't something that just, we're, we're gonna trudge along and get it all done. Um, and I think that that's a big way, reason we have such burnout in this field because it's a lot, right? If you're really doing the work, the real work, it's tiring, it's a lot, right? Um, but I guess recognizing that the, we can share the, the load, right? And kind of work in tandem with each other.
I'm also in Jersey, by the way. I'm in North Brunswick. So like, let's connect. I love it. <laughs> All the connections. I just love it. <laughs> Are there any um, kind of final thoughts or questions or? Dr. Dollarhide, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us um, and for just being a model for what, what revolution I think within our within our field looks like so thank you for that um, a question for you would be what what how open are you to others those of us that are new coming into the field um, early career educators in terms of collaborating and furthering your model um, work on the model as well as um, as you had indicated the need for for this to be utilized with people of color um and i would even extending it to specifically from on a more global scale internationally you know um and so i just wanting to to know what your thoughts are on that um i thank you john i very much appreciate the uh, the comment um you know um just individuals have reached out um and and have said hey you know I, i'd love to work on a study and so it you know i think there are there are just tremendous there's tremendous opportunity for for thinking about different projects that could involve the model or um you know the application of the model um i tend to be a qualitative researcher um so there may be uh, quantitative um, uh, measures that that could really bring tremendous, you know, in, insight to what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be tweaked or adapted or amended. Or <laughs> the model it will evolve as as each person uses it. That's very clear. So. Um, yeah, so if you want to email me and just kind of say, you know, hey, I'm interested or I'm doing this and that kind of thing, I'd, I'd be very happy to to have more conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I see we're we're almost out of time. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming, for contributing to the conversation, for bringing your energy and your ideas and your what ifs and what abouts. Um, th those are absolutely essential for moving us forward. And so, you know, this every conversation about social justice brings more energy to the topic and brings more commitment. So it, it fills my heart and I wanna thank each and every one of you. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Dollarhide. Um, I, I second everybody, this has been incredible. Um, there's so many things to love about your model, but one that's jumping out to me so much is just the passion that clearly ignites um, just from this conversation, um, just the, the communication and community alone. So thank you again for your time. Um, just to last couple notes for those of you looking for any continuing education credit, you'll see a survey that Tina posted in the chat. Uh, be sure to grab that before you go and complete that and then we'll get your certificate out to you. Um, and then again, we will have our next event on July 28th. So check out our website, keep an eye open on our social media pages um, and join us again in July for our next webinar. So thank you again, Dr. Dollarhide and thank you everybody for joining us. I actually just wanted to add one last thing yes, that it sounds like y'all are so invested in social justice and we just want to invite you if you are so inclined to join uh, counselors for social justice, like we could definitely use your mind. Uh, we can definitely use more folks on the, on the, on the ground doing the work and who are really invested in really caring for the community about right around us. Um, 
I put my own because I'm being like a little selfish plug because I want to like connect with y'all. Like, so y'all have my email. I would love to like get to know more people in Jersey um, who are trying to fight the fight, right? And do the work. Um, but yeah, totally uh, would love y'all to come on board with CSJ. That's our little plug. Okay. Be well now. Yeah.